Day 160 of another trip thousands of feet under the sea going towards the South China Sea. I feel the cold, harsh air of the boat in the back of my throat as I lay in my bed. The concept of ever breathing normally through my nose is long gone, along with my tan and warm summer days in Hawaii. As I mentally prepare for another day away from the outside world, I hear the loud swinging doors of birthing open. The ship's messenger was right on time to give his favorite morning announcements, going from rack to rack, slowly waking everyone up that needs to go to war again, as my captain used to say. I swing my legs out of my top rack, carefully avoiding my bunkmates that are sleeping under me, and land quietly on my feet. Suddenly, the angle of the boat changes, giving everyone on board a feel of the full force and speed of the mighty USS Hammerhead. Quickly, I rush to get dressed, balancing to put on my socks with one foot in the air, careful to not, to not fall flat on my face as the boat now starts to rock back and forth. Right next to me, my pair of coveralls hang from the nearby rack hook with my newly earned E5 crows and submarine fish staring back at me, a reminder of how far I've come in my four year journey so far. Making it up four ranks and passing two advancement exams, plus learning all the onboard systems, not only that I was in charge of, but also the ones I'm, that I may need to know in order to fight a casualty on board and save someone's life, earning the right to wear those shiny pins on my chest and collar. The image of the lone sailor pops into my head, and now I too was on my way to becoming the perfect sailor, a symbol of accomplishment not just to myself, but to the whole world, a reminder to myself that anything is possible and that I should be proud of my hard work. I roll up my sleeves and cuff my pant legs so I don't look like a child wearing his dad's clothes and head out the door immediately greeted by the smell of greasy bacon, fresh pancakes, and warm coffee, as well as the loud chattering of the crew patiently waiting to eat some food and take a break from the harsh reality that is being on mission. I head down the non-vertical ladder to middle level and make my way to control, the brain of the boat, where every depth change, sonar sensor, or angle on the bow is seen or controlled. As I move the giant Navy flag hanging from the ceiling above to the side, I hear the loud, deep voice of the ship's engineer, whose fiery red hair stands out even in the dark glow of control. His hair, or what's left of it, matches his constant demeanor with the crew quickly naming him the firecracker or the bearded dragon, depending if we were in port or not. The pilots, one of the most senior and most respected watchstanders on board, listen carefully knowing that one wrong move is a quick way to getting a mouthful from the captain. Quickly and quietly, I make my way to my little box of a room in the far corner of control, radio as it's called, on the ship's drawings, but ironically not even big enough to fit all six members of my radio division in there comfortably. I stare in the corner trying to remember the new pin and checking my surroundings so no one can sneak up behind me to see me put it in. With the large strip of emergency red string lights along the floor and walls ending before the locked door, barely giving me a, just enough light to not be in complete darkness, I hear the distinct click of the lock disengaging after I correctly enter the right set of numbers and quickly turn the door handle. As soon as I walk in, it's as if a portal to a whole nother world opened, silent, but with a sense of worry and nervousness in the air. I see my first class leading petty officer working on his laptop with a huge smug grin on his face, a complete 180 from our newest division member who just turned 19 before deployment, panicking to make it from server to server on time. While not shown to the rest of the crew because of differing clearances on board, the job of a radio man is a hard and unrewarding one since without us, there are no messages or connection to the outside world. Just like a plane asking for permission to land, every inch of water we operate in needs to be approved and tracked. We are the middlemen when it comes to being able to reach the outside world, a voice for the crew, and most importantly, the captain. I walk up to our new division member and ask him how establishing communication circuits and receiving message traffic is going. A fancy way of saying, have you reached the satellite yet? After getting a full summary on how the radio room is acting and what outside communications we were able to reach, a message is received titled, for captain's eyes only. I quickly rush to the wardroom, the ship's onboard equivalent to the Oval Office, hand delivering the message to the captain. Shortly after, a shipwide announcement is made to muster the war council, which echoes all the way through the metal walls and into the vast deep sea. 
An order that everyone on board knows means something big is about to happen. After grabbing a cup of coffee and hearing the non-stop theorizing slash worry of the crew that we might get extended and have to spend an extra month out at sea on our already six-month scheduled deployment, I make my way back to the wardroom, now ready to give my report and current status of the radio room a requirement whenever we do any new mission planning. The tiny dining room that also doubles as the ship's confer conference hall is now packed with all the ship's essential watch stations, plus the top brass of the boat, including, of course, both the captain and executive officer, the president and the vice president, respectively, of the boat. The clock strikes the top of the hour, and the privacy covers on the doors go on to make sure no one that's not in the room can see anything. Immediately, the captain greets the room with an excited but stern look on his face, grabbing everyone's full attention. Men, we have been selected to do God's work today, and we will be tasked with a new mission essential to national security and peace throughout the world. We will be shooting four Tomahawk missiles with orders correct coming directly from above. Everyone looks around, trying not to be the first one to say anything, but all of us felt the full weight of the words. No one slept that day. Tons of people huddled around the halls discussing what all of this meant, many not knowing the current state of the outside world but willing to do anything and everything that needed to be done. As our ship's motto put it, we are the tip of the spear, and that day we were going to strike with everything we had. To this day, I can still remember the thunderous shaking of the boat as we launched each tomahawk to the sky, people cheering in the hallways after each successful launch. Thunderstruck by ACDC being played throughout the ship's intercom system, one person even asked if it would be possible for us to see the footage, something probably more fitting for a football game. But what, you could ex but what could you expect when this was literally the thing we had been trained to do with an environment that was purposely created to reward group thinking rather than individuality, something the Navy drills into you time and time again, ship, shipmates, self. Once the dust had settled and we had gone back to the deep depths of the Pacific, the captain made sure to go to each of the ship's wash sections and praised us for our bravery and flawless execution of the strike, calling us heroes protectors of the free world but as soon as the cheers started to fade the voices of the crew grew quiet much like the lone sailor we went back to standing watch and waiting diligently for the next moment we might have to strike again a village in a faraway land now laid rubble its people dead and laying in the sand waiting for someone to see them and clean up the mess meanwhile nothing but a few bubbles laid on the surface of the ocean where we once stood till those two were gone unlike the blood on our hands. Tick, 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 boom. Tick, 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 boom. A throbbing pain in one ear starts to form, and a high-pitched screech in the other is ringing the alarm to wake up. The tea and tinnitus is doing its job, again reminding me it's time to take my medicine, echoing in my ear nonstop. I jolt up from my sleep and realize it's the same dream again. Rubbing my eyes, I feel the pool of sweat down my back collected from another restless night haunted by memories of the past. Swinging my legs onto the floor, I open the blinds. The light from the sun feels like God's wrath shaming me for what I have done. I quickly turn away and now stand face to face with myself. The closet mirror shows my, me my reflection, which reminds me of simpler times when these struggles did not exist. The person I once was, the person I so desperately wish to be again. The person I wish was never taken away from me and the person that I now have to fight every day to be. But this struggle is sadly not mine to fight alone. Much like the statue of the lone sailor, I'll never be alone. Since once I signed that contract to give my life away, it no longer became my own, but that of the Navy. That of its sailors that stand watch diligently, putting their life on the line day in and day out, past or present, no questions asked. But maybe that's part of the issue. Maybe this lone sailor shouldn't stand quietly in the night holding all the hardship to himself. On Christmas Day, 2020, I had been sexually assaulted by one of my shipmates. Shame ran through me whenever I thought about telling someone, whenever I wasn't showing strength, whenever I wasn't one of the boys, whenever I felt a bit of pressure and couldn't handle it. When I finally opened up to one of my superiors, not only was I not believed, I was told to just keep working until we can make it back to land. Both physically and mentally trapped within the giant metal war machine I was in, I agreed once on land, I tried committing suicide, landing me in inpatient care for three weeks, but still, seen, still deemed fit enough, both mentally and physically, to go back on the submarine after. This time, I was welcomed back 
with a video of my assault that had quickly spread on the boat. Not being able to handle the constant jokes and belittling every corner, I turned and ran away from the boat in the middle of the day and tried talking, seeking help from one of the squadron therapists, which recommended me for separation since the Navy did not have the resources to help me heal from my assault and that the real issue was my borderline personality disorder, in his opinion. A statement later backed up and repeated verbatim by my captain, the same one that looked me in the eyes only a few months prior thanking me for my excellent service. Consistently, I think, if I just never reported my assault, would my life be better than what it is today? Is it really my fault for letting this all affect me and throwing away an amazing Navy career to not even get the person arrested or have any form of compensation from the Navy, even losing my reenlistment bonus and having to pay it all back since I was asked to speak to a therapist. When I think about the sacrifice I made and if it was really worth it, it's hard not to feel sad, but also angry at the state of a branch that gave me so much as well as took so much from me. I don't think I'll ever be able to look at the military the same anymore. If I was a great sailor and a hero, what happens to those that barely scratch by? Are they cursed to a worse fate? Just like the lone sailor, I felt I didn't have a voice. But now after everything, I'm learning once again to use mine, not just for myself, but for those that feel the same.